Entropy is insurmountable, and any struggle against it only fuels it. So even hope leads to despair. So despair, and in your despair, find your purpose. There is nothing among all things that is not subject to decay. No civilization can forever resist the wiles of its enemies. No king endures the perpetual intrigue of his adversaries. Life cannot escape decay. Even a false emperor with all his sacrificial worshippers and thousands of tech priests will not escape the ravages of time and ultimate destruction. The question is, what happens when the end comes? And Nurgle is the answer to that question. Every inevitable end brings the beginning of something new. When a Katachan devil catches a trap and devours a careless imperial guardsman, the fighter's life comes to an end, but gives rise to the growth of the Nurgle. The rotting flesh flaking scabs from the hand of the sick hive gang member is left in the sewers, where it becomes food for the plague rats that live a miserable existence in those dark, maggot-filled tunnels. Even a free trader who has had his contract terminated is forced to find new prospects for business. There is no end without the hope of rebirth. It is because of this undeniable fact of life that Nurgle is known to many as the Lord of all things, for there is nothing that is not at his mercy. Truly, there is no creature, action or outcome that does not serve Nurgle's further purposes. In essence, the Plague Lord can simply get comfortable and wait as long as everything that happens in the universe goes according to his plan. However, Nurgle has no intention of idly watching. There is too much energy and enthusiasm in him to just stand idly by. In the depths of his home, he creates contagions, both physical diseases and dangerous ideas, which Nurgle and his assistants then release into the mortal realm. He welcomes resistance from those who try to deny his will, for with each new rebuff, Nurgle learns new ways to circumvent their defenses. Each healing brings forth ever new, more powerful diseases. Each victory of his enemies is a failure, for it comes at such a cost that it leaves the defenders open to Nurgle's ever-evolving plague. Such is its nature. Resistance is defeat in itself. Change is only a postponement, nothing more. Fleeing and denial will buy time at the cost of suffering, and in the realm of chaos, time means nothing. The records of many intelligent races in the galaxy often state that the Nurgle bring corruption and doom to all things. In some small way they are right, but on a scale their definitions are very limited and do not encompass the greater truth. The more primitive races are far more aware of the undeniable nature of the Lord of Inevitability. Life is struggle and destruction. Having met the dawn, one should expect the sunset and then, in turn, experience the night. On a larger scale, if a certain creature is given the luxury of witnessing the rise and fall of empires, of witnessing the birth of the sun and their inevitable collapse into a seething mass of cosmic destruction, it will surely recognize Nurgle as the shepherd of fate. Only Nurgle's predilection for decay, disease and putrefaction prevents more beings from accepting his truth. It may be difficult for a mortal to accept a rotting limb or disembodied viscera as a blessing. Nevertheless, they are. Even the tormented emperor of mankind, securely ensconced in his golden throne, is a testament to Nurgle's greatness. Every day thousands of people give their flesh bodies and immortal souls to this false idol in a vain attempt to support its decaying existence. It is a battle that is obviously lost. Yet the ammunition wasted in this conflict, the human bodies doomed to senseless death, serves Nurgle's purpose. Each fallen mortal generates new life and new hope. It is on this exchange that the Lord of Pestilence centers his interests. Flesh is the bargaining chip in his realm, and hope is the interest he pays in his investments. Indeed, Nurgle embodies the nature of all things and therefore deservedly bears the title of Fly Lord. Of course, the very process of erection and creation anticipates destruction and decay. Today, a palace, tomorrow ruins. The maiden in the morning, the old woman at night. And the hope of the current moment is nothing but the cornerstone of eternal sorrows. The lost and the damned. Life in an unfeeling galaxy is hard, dangerous and full of pain and suffering. Service to an indifferent emperor or a mysterious indifferent cosmic entity is absolutely even and meaningless. People live and die and for what? For others to stand on their graves and preach? Where is the reward in that? For those who have accepted the infinite gifts of the Master of Plagues, the reward is eternal hope. 
The bolters rust, the shells they fire are spent, and the fingers that squeeze the triggers are weakened by the passage of time and repetitive actions. In the course of their lives, mortals are wounded, become infected, fall ill and die from their wounds or simply from old age. There is no escape from dilapidation, and yet people keep trying. The struggle against decay spurs them on, motivates them to achieve greatness. It gives them hope that better times lie ahead. Endless possibilities in a universe that knows only unchanging, crushing doom. It is the Plague Lord who brings light into the darkness. It is Nurgle who gives weak mortals the strength to resist false ecclesiarchy and the rest. It is the Embracing Grandfather who inspires his followers to reject the doom of mortal decay and use it as a source of strength for his animation. In the marketplaces of backward planets and in the idle cathedrals of the Adeptus Ministorum chapter houses, preachers spew lies to unsuspecting foolish crowds. They warn people against the corruption of the soul and the pollution of the spirit. They admonish their listeners that to deny their faith is to join the ranks of the lost and damned, their words failing to capture the horror of the truth. All chaos gods have dual natures, but Nurgle understands better than other destructive forces that the seemingly different parts of his essence actually work together in a self-sustaining cycle. They stand apart from each other, being different interpretations of the same thing. Corn, for example, is the blood god and lord of skulls, absolute carnage, and he is also the god of warrior pride and a sense of accomplishment or perfection, albeit in the business of killing. These two halves can be seen as two sides of the same coin, but the coin must be flipped to see and appreciate both sides. But the coin is an illusion. There is no separation between its sides, no beginning and no end. The coin is only an inexpressive metaphor for mortals to reflect the influence of Nurgle. On one side is decay, death and disease. What is on the other side of that coin is essentially its own part of the first side. Hope, rebirth, Resistance and growth grow out of the encounter with death and decay. The seers of the artificial worlds of the Eldar Inquisitor of the Imperium will never share this truth with the weak-willed fools that drink their lies like mother's milk. To the Chaos Lord, Nurgle's actions seem oddly harmonious, even caring. To receive Nurgle's blessing, one must want to live and do anything for survival. Everything else follows naturally. The followers of Khorne must wreak ever greater destruction and carnage despite the risk to themselves or even their allies. Those who have given themselves to Tsinch must turn away from their lot in life and seek to change everything, never valuing what they have. The servants of Slanesh seek ways to escape reality through clouding of the senses and self-deception. To feel the caring touch of Nurgle is enough to see life as it is and make the most of it. All it takes is faith in the future that Nurgle will provide. While the invitation to walk the plague-laden path of Nurgle should be seen as an honour, not everyone views it that way. Withering due to a seemingly malignant influence is full of pain and repulsive to others. When a child's flesh turns a sickly pale green colour, and his eyes are covered with a veil and become empty orbs, milky and unseeing, the child's father realises that he is unable to save his child from suffering. The blackened and blood-oozing battle wound of a friend, the putrid stench that fills the air inside the barracks is a reminder of the fragility of all mortals. Should Nurgle have a hand in this decay through a blow with a rusty blade or the release of a plague, many will curse his name. For those unable to see that this pain and suffering lifts the veil that hides the truth of life and death from them, such moments and pictures are horrific. However, some blessed mortals can behold what decay is. A gift from the Lord of Pestilence. This gift, regardless of its form, opens the eyes even as it liquefies them. It simultaneously atrophies the muscles of the legs and empowers them to step towards a greater purpose. Such is Nurgle's primary ambition, to bring about the end of the universe by corroding the foundations of reality, similar to how disease corrodes the spirit and bodies of the infected. Thanks to the careful and ongoing experiments that have begun in his wondrous garden and the spilling of their results onto the galaxy, the pillars that support the framework of existence are slowly but surely thinning. The time will come when they will finally collapse and major changes will begin in the universe.
The old ways will be brushed aside like an annoying fly. All that existed will disappear, and from the rotting remains will emerge a new, grand reality of Nurgle and his beloved children at the helm. Those who step with the Lord of the Plague and assist him in bringing about the Great Decay, as Nurgle himself calls it, do so with joy in their hearts. It makes their existence worthwhile in spite of and because of the caring overlord. I gazed upon its splendour, my entire gaze filled with its majestic size. All around me was filled with flesh and smiling flies. Inside his carcass I discerned smaller minions that were feeding on the guts that had been released outside. At his feet were pools of pus and other bodily fluids in which his children splashed and played enthusiastically. It was a blessing to behold such majesty and joy, and it was with great sadness that I awoke to a world of imperial dogma and instruction. I knew the path I must tread. Taken from Ulbima's journal. When it comes to understanding the majesty of the Plague Father's physical form, those who have the privilege of reading about him in the pages of the arcane texts of the Black Library are on equal footing with the primitive warriors gathered around smoking campfires on travelling orc marauder slaughter cruisers. Nurgle, like the other gods of chaos, has no single form that can be recorded, analysed, comprehended or told to others. His greatness is beyond the comprehension of mortal minds. Nevertheless, if one digs into the comparable histories and galaxy-spread myths associated with Nurgle, certain commonalities will be revealed. While other gods in the Chaos Realm are associated with dozens or even hundreds of descriptions, the Plague Father's appearance has far fewer variations. Legends and tales universally describe Nurgle in an unsightly manner. He is said to be a huge pile of rotting flesh with open, gaping wounds in which his lesser servants frolic and revel. Wet pustules ooze filth, and Nurgle's intestines are constantly discharging rotting waste and small Nurglings. Maggots and other fall-eaters lay eggs under his fingernails, around which cysts form that periodically burst and spill their stinking contents. Maybe the tales are true, maybe not. It doesn't matter, though, because Nurgle lives in a mansion in the centre of the garden, there's no denying the simultaneous combination of sordidness and marvellousness in his creations, as well as the infectious joy with which he goes about his work. Even if none of these crazy stories can be considered perfectly accurate, it is hard to deny the similarities between them. These similarities go beyond mere nauseating descriptions of his non-healing wounds, exposed insides and overwhelming stench. Decay is a part of Nurgle's nature, but apparently it also includes jocularity and enthusiasm. Such is the paradox of the Lord of the Plague. Perhaps it is his boundless energy and the fervour with which he enjoys his work, and his indomitable playfulness that eats away at the minds of those many who ponder his life. It seems impossible to believe that this chubby, stinking spreader of plague and doom can simultaneously radiate mirth and worry about the billions of souls upon whom he has unleashed his devastating and deadly plague. To turn the mind to link such sordidness with such frivolity is to let madness in. Fortunate are those who are able to do this without going mad. They have taken an important step toward understanding the great decay to come. Unlike their less enlightened fraternity, they alone will realize that the Lord of the Plague is a tireless gardener of decay who is always trying to prepare a slowly fading reality for a horrifying apotheosis. His enemies will wither and die. His allies will wither and die. The universe and everything in it will wither and die. Then a great decay will reign over the lands that will permeate the very fabric of reality after which the Lord of Pestilence will rise from the rot and the remains and spread his arms wide to take back all his obedient children. Victory, rebirth from the summers of inevitability. Though they embrace each day they have left, anticipating the inevitable, the servants of Nurgle must accept their final death. They must also believe in an equally likely rebirth. This hope of something new and magnificent is the great comfort that the Plague Father shared with them, a hope born of Nurgle's own understanding of how the universe works. Just as his followers accepted the teachings of their Lord, Nurgle himself long ago accepted that decay brings the end of all things, but it is through it that life begins anew. 
Decay is the winner in every battle and cannot be thwarted. That is why Nurgle values decay as a weapon, as a tool, as a way to instruct and guide his followers. Decay is the essence of Nurgle's philosophy and methods. Blessed with altered forms and a new purpose, Nurgle's minions become instruments of the great decay. As vessels and embodiments of decay, mortal demons are the effective living fuel that feeds the great cycle through their actions and rotting, poisoning presence in the realm of chaos and on the mortal plane of existence. Decay. Delicious putrefaction. Few sworn to Nurgle do so, believing him to offer an easy path to power and glory. Unlike other gods, the Lord of Plague does not promise increased influence, ferocious power, or hedonistic excesses. Those who turn to him for help are not looking for a way to make dreams come true, crush enemies, or gain the adoration of others. No, most mortals who seek to enter Nurgle's stinking embrace wish only to end suffering of one sort or another. They call upon him for protection from an incurable disease, for salvation from a slow, agonizing death due to rampant infection, or to escape any other ailment. There are even those who do not seek the service of the Lord of Pestilence himself. Instead, one of his messengers comes to them and offers them a bargain. Whether they sought to obtain Nurgle's gifts, or those found them on their own, the exchange turns out to be quite different than expected. Mortals cast aside fears and doubts. They find that they are no longer restrained by the paralyzing grip of despair and suffering. However, their diseases do not recede, and other ailments are usually added to them. New ulcers and pustules appear, and the foul fluids they contain become home to small worms and maggots. Stomachs swell and inflate, and the fetus is deformed to accommodate the bleeding innards that push the abdomen outward. Old wounds randomly reopen, inviting fresh infections inside. Whatever diseases and weaknesses drove the once mortals to rid themselves of them remain forever inside their bodies and minds. All of this must be taken as the first lesson of Nurgle, the disintegration is imminent, yet majestic. This knowledge enlightens the follower of the Fly Lord. If decay is destined for everything, then every moment is a gift. For these new children that Nurgle has taken in, it looks as if the morning fog has dissipated and they can now see the world clearly, thanks to their renewed eyes. Why did they complain so much about their illnesses and failing bodies? What was this selfish desire to change their fate for the sake of avoiding understanding their true purpose? Decay. Delightful decay becomes an eternal companion to the servants of the Lord of Pestilence, who instructs them, guides them along their chosen path, and reminds them that they have been smiled upon with incredible good fortune, for Nurgle has chosen them and shared his gifts. Ultimately, every Chaos God seeks the same thing. They all wish to change the existing order of things and gain power over both the realm of chaos and the mortal world. The question of how to achieve this goal and who will become the ruler of the universe is answered differently by each dark god. Slanesh wants to turn existence into a playground where he and his minions can endlessly pursue new pleasures. Khorne only wants every skull and drop of blood that will serve as mortar for the foundation of his new kingdom. Here, Zench clearly has his own designs on what kind of distorted reality he will create, but the Lord of Change doesn't share his vision with anyone. Perhaps Zench doesn't fully know it himself. To Nurgle, all these alternatives are not particularly distinguishable, selfish fantasies that have nothing to do with a higher purpose or understanding of the nature of things. Ambition, other in the eyes of the Lord of Pestilence, is insignificant. Genesis will be beautiful. And both the mortal world and the realm of chaos will pass along the path of disintegration which will bring death and an end to all things. An ending, but not an irrevocable ending. It seems that only Nurgle understands the meaning of things and the differences between them. Where his divine brethren draw the end of the journey in their imagination, Nurgle realizes that the journey repeats itself again like a loop, leading to rebirth fullness of life and new beginnings. This fundamental difference of opinion leads to quarrels between Nurgle and the other Chaos Gods, for it implies that they have more than one goal in mind. At first glance, the end result seems to be the same, despite the different methods. The destruction of the Imperium, 
the enslavement or annihilation of all mortals and ultimate dominion over all reality. However, this is a superficial understanding of the truth. The differences are many. Slanesh readily allows the Plague Warriors to inflict monstrous damage on the enemy army through ailments and disease, but is then perplexed when the servants of Nurgle do not allow the Prince of Pleasure to amuse himself with the wounded, taking their shredded bodies with him before Slanesh can enjoy himself. Korn also works normally with his brother Nurgle in destroying a colony of Krut, but does not understand why the Plague Lord insists on leaving their former homeland intact instead of turning it into charred, lifeless stone. Nevertheless, such incidents are a thing of the past, and the gods write them off to the whims of their jolly brother. Zinch, on the other hand, is a different story. He refuses to give Nurgle credit or allow him to pursue his own agenda. The Lord of Change twitches, twists and deflects. He warps, redirects and changes. Zinch can't accept that everything will come to an end one way or another. He's always trying to change the rules to gain an advantage to achieve his goal, even if it means interfering with Nurgle's plans, no matter how small the consequences. The Plague Lord realizes the futility of such interventions. He knows there is no stopping the journey, but his brother's machinations still vex and anger him. The actions of Korn and Slanesh cause little concern, but Zinch's games ruin Nurgle's plans, creating unnecessary and harmful problems not only for the Plague Lord's purpose, but for the other Dark Gods as well. Few things can make Nurgle stop smiling, but Zinch appears to be able to provoke such a reaction. When the universe dies and is reborn again, more than anything else, the Lord of Pestilence hopes that Zinch, as well as the Lord of Pestilence, will not be resurrected with him. Nurgle's garden is an unusual garden. It may not be a garden at all, but mortal minds, contemplating the incarnate will of the Lord of Decay, need to try to make some sense of what they see or hear in whispered tales. They need to put it into some recognizable context so that they can ponder it without going insane. The forbidden texts that have attempted to describe the Lord of the Lands himself mostly agree that the idea of portraying Nurgle's realm as a vicious, deadly, and yet extraordinarily beautiful garden does a better job of corralling chaos into concepts and terms that can be comprehended. Like an ordinary garden, Nurgle's domain is home to a bewildering variety of flora and fauna, each representative interconnected with the others and supporting the overall whole. The petal pawpaws growing in the beds are self-excavated and leave the dirt in which they have grown, so that the plague bearers can new skull seeds into the fertile clay soil. When the skull seeds sprout and flowers appear, they attract the attention of leaping, stomping and super energetic beasts of chaos who mistake the fruits of these plants for the heads of new toys. Their contents splash frantically into the air where they remain on the wings of the ubiquitous flies. Slowed by the viscous pulp of the squished plants, the insects become easy prey for other flying creatures, which swallow them as they hover in the putrefying air. What the predators don't know, however, is that the bloated flies are carriers of Nurgle's many experimental diseases and other of his creations. When the internal organs of the raptors become infected, they vomit and spew the contents of their stomachs, splashing them all over the garden as they fly eventually exploding in a spray of life-generating flesh and blood. These gifts of mutated and mangled tissue fall into new areas of the garden, decomposing to compost and giving rise to another cycle of life and death. Though the Garden of Nurgle shares certain commonalities with gardens and jungles on the planets of real space, it is not a mundane garden in any adequate sense of the word. The visitor to this outlandish and dangerous place does not hang around here and there, he experiences only what he needs to experience. Even the demons who tend the garden are not what one might take them for. They are not a labor force that arrives on site, does the work, and leaves for other regions. These demons are part of the garden itself, which is especially problematic for the plague bearers, whose altered minds were once mortal, causing them to be able to comprehend only a tiny fraction of the reality in which their unnatural existence stretches. Nevertheless, 
Even the plague bearers accept their place in the garden and spend their eternity enjoying all that it offers. The plague father gives all of his children many opportunities to explore and experience his realm and even becomes a part of it himself. Though he is the god of chaos, Nurgle is also required to create order, oversee his creations and supervise experiments. A visitor to the realm, the Lord of Pestilence, will have an unimaginable amount of varied experiences. There he may find trees made of Eldar's flesh, constantly oozing with the tears of a dying race. He may find fields where tongues grow out of the ground, each covered in blisters due to the deleterious effects of various infections. It is impossible to describe all the wonders awaiting visitors at every bend in the paths that stretch and loop throughout the garden. But an encounter with any of them will definitely be a test for the psyche if the guest is going to survive and tell about it. The Garden of Nurgle is a fickle reality, changing according to the needs and whims of its lord. Many areas of the garden exist only temporarily, taking on a form that allows them to indulge a particular fantasy of the Plague Lord, or becoming the reward of a particularly successful Great Unclean. Even so, there is a hint in the legends that some parts of this stinking realm are relatively permanent. Nurgle needs fields to sow disease-stricken herbs, pits for the bodies he experiments on, and most importantly, a giant and dilapidated mansion where the Plague Lord keeps his creations, infuses legendary contagions, entertains guests, and sets the course of the Great Decay. While decay and epidemics ravage the reality of mortals, the lands of Nurgle in the realm of chaos bloom thanks to disease and corruption. This hideous place, tended by the Lord of Decay, is home to every plague imaginable and filled with the stench of decay. Twisted, decaying branches, entangled with tenacious vines, cover the humus-rich earth and intertwine like broken fingers. Half-demonic plants sway nonchalantly in their stems, swaying in the insect-filled air to some consonance of their own, their colours piercing the gloom, presenting islands of liveliness in the oppressive forests. Bugs with human faces flutter along the banks of sluggish, muddy rivers. The reeds make crackling noises, whispering the names of the plagues the great Nurgle has unleashed upon the mortal worlds, or mourning those who have died from the mercies of their creator. Out of this primeval drow protrudes the manor of Nurgle. Ancient and dilapidated, but always standing firmly on its foundations, the mansion is a heterogeneous structure of rotting beams and crumbling walls, overgrown with creeping poison ivy and thick moss. Cracked windows and loose wood are juxtaposed with patina-covered bronze, rusted ironwork and lichen-covered cornices. They all try to outdo each other in their deteriorated charm. Within these crumbling walls, Nurgle is hard at work. Beneath the mouldy and sagging beams, the great god is forever at work at a rusty cauldron so huge that it could hold all the oceans of all the worlds. Giggling and muttering to himself, Nurgle busily creates sicknesses and diseases, the most perfect and uninhibited forms of life. Each stir of the Plague Lord's larvae-laden scoop brings forth a dozen new infestations, which are then scattered among the stars. From time to time, Nurgle reaches down with his clawed hand to scoop up a portion of the horrible mixture and send it into his mouth, tasting the fruits of his labours. Every day, he comes closer and closer to creating the perfect disease, a spiritual plague that will spread through the universe and gather all living things into the rotting embrace of the plague god. Around Nurgle crowds a host of plague bearers, overshadowed by their mighty lord. Each chants ringingly as they continue to count the created contagions of mischievous Nurglings born and the souls harvested by the corrupted blessings of the Lord of Decay. These chants are drowned out by the creaking of rotten ceilings and the squeak of the scoop on the surface of the cauldron. To hear these diabolical, monotonous sounds is to condemn oneself to madness. As Nurgle's diseases spread in the mortal realm, his garden blossoms from the heads of the dead and fresh offal, invading the lands of the other Chaos Gods. War ensues as the rivals of the Plague God strike back, at which point the Plague Gods take up arms and stand in defence of the Dread Forest. Such a war entails an abundance of life and death and a triumph of calamity. 
Though the kingdom of Nurgle eventually retreats, it feeds in abundance on the fallen. The garden will be at rest until it is prepared to expand again through time and space. At the center of Nurgle's garden stands the House of Decay. This mangled and ruined structure creaks and groans under the blows of the pernicious, toxic winds. Shutters barely cling to the window frames, where only half of the dirty glass remains. Sewage drains spew beetles, maggots and scolopendras with tongues instead of bodies and human fingers instead of toes. The paint is constantly cracking and peeling off the wood underneath. However, the house never loses its grey-green tone. Dark clouds emerge from the hundreds of pipes on the roof, which, upon closer inspection, turn out to be millions of flies swooping and buzzing. Around the mansion grow bone trees with fruit that rots even as they swell. The leafless branches of these ancient trees give shelter to demonic birds that sing funeral songs to every unwanted visitor. This is the home of plague, decay and death. It is the mansion of Nurgle, and as such it is also a place of hope and renewal. It is impossible to explain the force that keeps the building from collapsing. Perhaps only because it is the home of the Lord of all that is, whose boundless energy, sense of eternal purpose and immense joy in his work are perfectly matched by the inevitability of decay. Nurgle himself often sits in a huge chair right next to the front door of the mansion. From there, he begs guests, both invited and uninvited, to approach him to share stories and questionable booze and to explore the countless rooms inside. In the vast building, a guest can easily get lost. Rotten floorboards have sent many to a slow death, to eaters falling to the lower levels. Giant staircases with moth-eaten mats beckon wandering souls, leading them into rooms to demons that welcome fresh, new flesh. If a guest passes these rooms and continues upward, they may find themselves in the attic, where Nurgle keeps samples of his many creations of decay, catalogued and counted by plague bearers selected for the job. In this attic are jars containing the insides of plague victims collected across time and space. Imprisoned inside these simple-looking glass containers, the souls are doomed to slowly fade away due to spiritual illnesses. If one descends the staircases below, deep into the mansion, he may stumble upon the kitchens and storerooms of the Plague Father's home. Every unholy ingredient, every component of the plague is stored here on the shelves, neatly labelled and ready to be combined within the Great Cauldron. A wise visitor will quickly leave this place, knowing that if one lingers here, one may become a condiment to the corrupt brew. For the cauldron is one of Nurgle's most prized possessions, and the Plague Lord loves it when it is always full. It is in this giant black cauldron that the Lord of Pestilence brews the plague, which he then releases into the mortal realm. The Plague Lord is a creative creature who draws inspiration to experiment wherever he can find it. Rarely is he able to resist the temptation to add guests to his poisonous brew. Nurgle is different from other destructive forces in many ways, including the way he surveys his domain in the realm of chaos. Corn, for example, rarely leaves his throne, rowing towards them, giving orders to his generals from atop piles of skulls. Slanish watches the goings-on in the realm from his palace, or by travelling the universe to seduce mortals and obtain their souls to satisfy his hunger. Zainch does not appear to be particularly interested in the state of his twisted and fractured lands, for he spends his time plotting and meddling in the affairs of realms beyond his own. Nurgle, for his part, cares for the beauty and surprises of his garden. He regularly strolls its curved paths, amusing himself with demons and stopping to watch one of his diseases affect his wounded captives. Nurgle keeps in touch with his lands and their many regions. In his outings outside the mansion, he peeks into some of his favourite places, many of which have begun to exist since the god first thought of them and are likely examples of the coming reborn universe. Closest to the mansion are the mortal lodges, where Nurgle probably visits most often. This place serves two purposes. Not only are lost travellers and defeated invaders imprisoned here, but they are kept at the bottom of deep pits and forced to drink humus slurry while awaiting further nefarious use or eventual death. In the death beds, Nurgle can enjoy one of his favourite pastimes. The Plague Father loves to hear stories of realms beyond his own. 
They inspire Nurgle to create new types of plague well adapted to other lands, and there are countless possible storytellers to be found in the Death Lodges. Occasionally he gives these poor creatures a chance to improve their situation. Then they spit out worms from their mouths and share stories of their worlds with him. Those who can entertain Nurgle sufficiently are dragged out of the mud and taken to the mansion. There they are given the great honour of becoming vessels for the new species of plague of the Fly Lord. When those are duly infected, Grandfather Nurgle smiles one last time, lovingly embraces them in a gut-wrenching hug, and sends them back to the lands described in the stories. After visiting the mortal lodges, Nurgle often stops at the plague grounds. Here he tests the effectiveness of his plagues on flesh and spirit. Each disease requires different tests that will determine their ability to achieve the designs of the Lord of All. This means that the physical form of the plague ground changes to suit the necessary purpose. For the spirit test, a given region of the garden may be filled with crystal clear lakes. A thirsty subject upon seeing the lakes may believe in salvation and take a deep drink from the cold waters. Suddenly the water turns to pus, causing torment to the sick and weakened soul. To check skin-eating diseases, a plague site may acquire claw-infested thorn bushes. Infected captives pursued by beasts of chaos may be sent fleeing straight into a thicket of demonic plants. If the captives scream as they tear through the razor-sharp branches, then Nurgle realizes that the poor thing is still capable of feeling pain, and therefore the diseases should be improved. Regardless of the incarnation of the plague site, this corner of the garden always allows Nurgle to learn new lessons, and so he spends a great deal of time here. There are other places like these, places that are always buzzing with activity and fun. The places where the most valuable and toxic herbs take root. The Dung Spittle Arboretum, where high-quality excrement hangs from the trees like decaying, stench-spewing vines and many others. All of these regions provide Nurgle with the ingredients and instructive information the Plague Father needs in his future work at the Cauldron, when he returns to the mansion after another invigorating walk. In addition to the main regions of the garden, there are many others that are not so permanent. They come and go with the rise and fall of one of the many types of plagues of Nurgle. Some plagues most likely exist only in nightmarish visions and dubious hallucinations of minds ravaged by the disease. Nevertheless, the garden is virtually endless, and it is not too hard to believe that the recipient of one of the Plague Lord's great gifts might be blessed with a fleeting glimpse of Nurgle's realm. In the final seconds of life, some mortals gulp for air with their mouths and struggle to speak of the faint ringing of bells they hear. Perhaps they tell of the flowers that grow in the fields of the funeral ringing lines. When a mortal dies of one of Nurgle's many diseases, one dead pale flower opens and emits a barely audible chime, marking the success of Nurgle's work. The ringing in the fields does not stop. The hanging gardens are well worth seeing. This remote slice of Nurgle's realm was granted to a great foul man for his achievement of using a suffocating plague to eradicate the orc infestation on Gorax, Nurgle's coveted planet. To celebrate the victory and demonstrate his eternal gratitude to his lord for this award, the Hanging Gardens suspended every orc from the colony from the trees of the granted domain using their own entrails. There they dangle and rot, slowly dying with no hope of release. The plague bearers throw organs pulled from the bodies of disease victims into the sorting ponds to make it easier to count the number of people who have died of each ailment. The Nurgle beasts frolic in the fields, where planted spines produce a crop of mental illness-inducing fodder. Nurgle's beasts cackle merrily as they drive down hillsides that randomly appear when the great unclean regurgitate regiments devoured millennia standard years ago. The Garden of Nurgle is a wondrous place, full of energy, fun and experiences beyond mortal comprehension. It is a playground for the servants of the Lord of Disintegration, a laboratory for his work and a cosy home for a god who knows that his realm takes the shape of things to come. The Eldari believe that when Slanesh, Lord of Pleasure, awakened at the beginning of the 30th millennium, their gods were destroyed once and for all. However, one artificial world has a myth that tells of the maiden goddess Isha, who, unlike the rest of the Eldari pantheon, was not killed or devoured by the Dark Prince after her birth during the fall of the Eldari. 
Slanish cast her into the warp along with the rest of the gods, but did not absorb Isha's energies permanently, but took her captive. None of the Eldari now know what nefarious purposes the Dark Prince had in mind, but in the end the Lord of Pleasure lost his trophy. For some reason, Nurgle, Lord of the Plague, went to war against Slanish to save the Eldari goddess. It is unclear why the Plague Father intervened, though some Eldari scholar mages believe that by doing so, the oldest of the major Chaos Gods wanted to teach the younger one a good lesson and point out the Dark Prince's place in the order of things. The victory of Nurgle's demonic forces is known, after which the Lord of All took the goddess Eldari to his domain in the realm of Chaos. The goddess of rejuvenation and the god of decay were an odd pairing, but Nurgle honoured his new companion like no other in the universe. Nevertheless, the adoration of a Chaos God is a strange thing, for Nurgle shows his affection in cruel ways. He keeps Aisha in a rusty cage in the corner of the room where his cauldron stands. When the Plague Lord creates a particularly pleasing brew, he forces Aisha to taste the noxious concoction with growing admiration, watching the symptoms of the new disease. Though Aisha, being the goddess of healing, is able to save herself from infection, the speed with which she does so allows the Plague Lord to assess the deadliness of the disease. If Nurgle is satisfied, he returns to the cauldron and pours its contents down a bottomless drain, whereupon the poisonous liquid rains down on one of the mortal worlds. If the brew does not meet Nurgle's approval, he swallows his concoction, regurgitates it into the pot, and begins again. While the Plague Father is busy cooking at the cauldron, Aisha, who has steadfastly accepted her position, begins to fight the evil of the Plague Father in the same way she once confronted Cain, whispering into the universe the cures for the new diseases so that mortals can learn about them and resist the monstrous schemes of Nurgle's grandfather. Few mortals have ever seen Nurgle's garden with their own eyes. These swamps constantly emit a mist of supernatural sickness and no living creature can inhale this abomination more than once. Only Nurgle himself can keep visitors safe from the garden's toxic effects. When he expects company, he opens a path through gurgling mushrooms and leafy branches with a single magnanimous gesture. Trespassers are treated poorly in Nurgle's realm, as the seers of Luganath have tested on their own skin, and the Eldari from this remote artificial world have long told the tale of the trapped maiden in which Aisha, goddess of fertility and healing, was held prisoner in Nurgle's mansion at the mercy of her terrible lover. These Azurians believe their legends to be absolutely true, and are even pushing for the day when they finally free the goddess from the clammy grip of the Lord of Decay. When the cold coma ravaged Luganath, an army of the artificial world's most gifted psychers sent their minds to the realm of Nurgle to discover the truth behind Isha's imprisonment. They hoped to locate the Lost Goddess and halt the march of the deadly disease across Luganath by freeing Isha. The Psychers realized they would likely die trying to do so, but they believed in the ultimate return of souls back to the shining soul stones of their comatose bodies. Being safe through crystalline post-mortem, they could pass the message to the Ishe spirits and banish the curse of Nurgle from their homes. At first, the astral projection of the Psychers seemed to pass through the tenacious vegetation of Nurgle's garden with ease. Their ghostly helmets held the Psychers in shaky spirit form, and their rune-protected minds slashed the sinister plants, for they were sharper than any material blade. Yet the rotting flies of the realm buzzed loudly and alarmingly, whispering in the Plague Lord's ear about the intruders. As soon as the seers of Luganath saw Nurgle's grandfather's mansion in the distance, a great army of Tumonians rose from the mud and went on the offensive with a monotonous chant. The Eldari channeled psychic energy into huge blasts of purifying blue fire, vaporizing huge chunks of Nurgle's army and evading the lumbering foes. However, more and more plague bearers emerged from the liquid clay to block the seers' path. The battle raged for entire Solarian days, and during that time entire regions of Nurgle's garden were destroyed. However, in the material dimension, the physical bodies of the invading Eldari began to twitch and shake, succumbing to the very plague they were trying to defeat. Their bodies slowly became decrepit, and their soul stones turned to humus. Locked away in the realm of Nurgle, 
the souls of the seers became fully manifested in the immaterium. The damp air of the garden penetrated their lungs, worm-infested mud enveloped their feet, and white demon flies crawled into their mouths. The seers' feet had taken root, their faces hardened and barked, their hands split and distorted into gnarled branches. From each finger dangled a ripe fruit in the shape of a nurgling. The seers of Luganath stood there still. Their corpses had become wailing trees, delighting Nurgle on his leisurely walks and bringing a note of despair to the heart of Isha, his immortal captive. Such is the fate of those who enter the heart of Nurgle's lands uninvited, for even kindness the Plague Lord has a limit. Despite his terrifying appearance, Nurgle can appear as a kind-hearted and welcoming god who takes pride in the accomplishments of his followers, bestowing the most dangerous diseases upon them and protecting them from the pain and cold sleep of death. The fear of death can be found in the heart of every intelligent creature in the universe, so there are always enough willing to sacrifice an immortal soul in exchange for the eternal spoiled preservation of their physical bodies. Unlike other chaos gods, Many of Nurgle's followers had no choice but to begin serving him. The spoils of the Lord of Pestilence spread readily among beasts and humanoids alike, and the monstrous and mysterious disease known as Nurgle's Rot can afflict even the strongest of men, making them exiles in the manner of leprosy patients. Despite the nature of its influence, Nurgle cares for the victims of its diseases. The Plague Lord vividly cares for them like a loving grandfather, causing his followers to often address him as Grandpa Nurgle. This also causes those who have never been infected to deliberately seek out diseases and even poison themselves to earn Nurgle's attention. The mentally unstable servants of the Lord of Epidemics say that he invents various contagions for the material universe for fun, and many of the most contagious and horrible diseases are proud creations of Nurgle. According to their beliefs, those who die in the grip of Nurgle's monstrous plague are carried straight to his kingdom. Nurgle has many petitioners, but among them there are few who have sufficient fortitude to declare themselves his champions. The handful that can survive the manifold blessings of the Great Decay display a feverishly morbid energy and an unnatural resistance to physical damage. Among the major sentient species of the galaxy, it is humanity that fears death and oblivion the most. And it is humans who have always made up the bulk of the Plague Lord's servants. In exchange for loyalty and service, Nurgle grants his followers immunity to disease and pain by infecting them with all existing natural diseases and many of the supernatural ones that have entered the real cosmos through the mysterious power of chaos. Nurgle champions can become the most powerful servants of chaos in the galaxy, though they will be endowed with some of the most all-encompassing and hideous physical mutations. Nurgle's beasts become swollen walking sacks of pus and decay, their flesh bloated and rotting from the very bones. They are constantly oozing organic fluids, the most hideous bacteria, viruses, fungi and infectious agents imaginable. In doing so, they become completely immune to these and any diseases at all, and their bodies are given a physical fortress capable of resisting injuries and damage that would destroy the most resilient. At the same time, despite their apparent weakness, those who have given their souls to Nurgle feel no pain. In fact, the opposite. For many, Nurgle's beasts speak of a feeling of strength and an almost narcotic state in which they feel much better than they did before the mutations. But Nurgle isn't just about looks, it's also about philosophy. Most mortal champions and many younger followers end up thinking like their god, albeit in a more limited manner due to the constraints of the mortal mind. Nurgle champions are a dire threat to densely populated worlds, where densely populated humans are highly vulnerable to a single contagion. Ships in the void are particularly susceptible to the disease, and many dying crews have begged the Lord of Decay for intercession. Such a fate befell the Death Guard, a legion of space marines, when it became stranded in the warp on the long voyage to Terra during the Horus Heresy. The Death Guard is a treacherous legion that has been completely imbued with the power of Nurgle, the god of plague. The very essence of the Legionnaires exemplifies everything this vile god of chaos stands for. Their bodies are hives of filth and decay, 
and their flesh is subject to perpetual decay, even though it is renewed through a constant process of death and rebirth. Nevertheless, the Death Guard was once the strongest and most resilient of all the Emperor's legions. Its legionnaires were the heirs of the Primarch Mortarion, from whose genetic likeness they were created. Long ago, they were known as the 14th Legion, known as the Twilight Raiders, founded on terror at the end of the 30th millennium to return the stars to humanity. At one time, they fought bravely and were little different from other spaceborne legions. Operating as heavy infantry, the Astartes of the 14th Legion were masters of survival and fortitude, quickly earning themselves a reputation as relentless and disciplined fighters among the other newly created legions. Their grey and unadorned power armour began to bear rank symbols and insignia that represented the modified heraldry of the Iron Fighters of Old Albia, a nation of techno-barbarians of Old Earth in the days before the Unification Wars. Most eloquently, their right wristbands, gauntlets and shoulder pads were dyed a rich dark red of dried blood, which now symbolised the red right hand of the Emperor's Justice. After the 14th Legion reunited with their Primarch Mortarion on the wild world of Barbarus, he renamed the Legion the Death Guard. Before Mortarion joined the Legion, it was made up of mostly terror inhabitants. Afterward, almost all neophytes were recruited from Barbarus. This changed the culture and traditions of the Legion so much that by the last days of the Great Crusade, at the dawn of the 31st millennium, there was a growing tension between the barbarous-born legionnaires and the Terran minority who were still in the Legion and remembered the early warrior traditions of the Twilight Raiders brought from Old Earth. This tension became even more apparent in the period before the First Battle of the Horus Heresy on Istvan III, when Mortarion deemed it likely that a third of the Legion would remain loyal to the Emperor while the Death Guard joined the Horus Rebellion against the Imperium. Many of these loyal Astartes were born on terror and fought as Twilight Raiders, such as the battle captain of the Seventh Great Company, Nathaniel Garrow, whose loyalty to the Emperor outweighed his loyalty to the Primarch. Mortarian warriors were always at the centre of the front line and the strength and determination inherited from the Primarch made them the indestructible core of any Imperial army of conquest. When the Horus Heresy plunged the galaxy into the Civil War, the legionnaires of the Death Guard were trapped in the warp and fell victim to a warp-born plague so terrible that not even the legendary fortitude of the Sons of Mortarion could withstand it. When the legionnaires hit the doldrums in Immaterium, a mysterious contagion began to spread through the Death Guard ships until the entire fleet was infected. Even the enhanced physiology of the Space Marines could not fight the horrible plague. Their guts swelled with corpse gases, their flesh bloated, and the legionnaires themselves rotted from the inside out. The disease caused the flesh to peel away from their bodies and turned these strongest and toughest warriors into disfigured poor men afflicted with delirium. It is said that when even the Primarch of the Mortarian Legion fell victim to the plague, he cried out in a speech, calling out to the destructive forces of chaos. His desperation to save himself and his own legion drew Nurgle, and Mortarion became the greatest champion, Lord of Pestilence. When the Death Guard Legion fleet finally emerged from the warp, its ships and warriors were completely changed. Once gleaming white and grey, the armour appeared covered in filth, and the proud warriors had become an entrancing haven of death and loathing. To make matters worse, the Plague Warriors of the Death Guard were now the bearers of the most dreadful contagions of their new lord, the Plague Lord Nurgle. Doomed to exist in an immortal state of decay, the fighters of the Death Guard began to spread their corruptions throughout the galaxy in the glory of chaos. At the end of the Horus Heresy, Primarch Mortarion led his legion into the Eye of Terror. And while others splintered into countless gangs, the Death Guard remained fundamentally intact, due in large part to their legendary strength and resilience. Mortarion led them to the world that would later become known simply as the Plague Planet, which he gave a new and hideous form, making it a virtual replica of Barbarus. To this day, the Death Guard organises attacks across the Cicatrix Maledictum Rift, deeper and deeper into the galaxy, 
sometimes in large units and sometimes in allied forces. It is still as eager to destroy Ultramar's domain and still as fearful in the hearts of mortals. Wherever they go, the plague warriors spread the cheerful exuberance of Nurgle's plague, bestowing those who will know eternal life with the plague god's select blessings. Rejoice, children. Your father brings you hope in your darkest hour. May those who accept his gifts step forward and receive the blessings of the Lord of Decay. Cast aside doubts and excuses. Brush aside belief in a false lord who fills your hearts with lies, regret and grief. Instead, embrace the delightful gifts of decay. Savor the beauty of decay and be reborn as a living symbol of steadfastness. Nurgle loves all his children, the mortals who have sworn allegiance to him, and the beautiful creations that have come from his pen. In the following, we will discuss the main representatives of Nurgle's worlds, highlighting from the variety of shapes and sizes those most commonly found on the battlefields and worlds affected by Nurgle. And the Great Father honors the Chosen Ones by bestowing upon them Nurglings. These servants sit on the backs of his many champions and Chosen Ones. They will fight for them, care for them, and assist in spreading the gifts of Father Nurgle throughout the unworthy and ungrateful Imperium of mankind. Excerpt from Liber Pestilentia. Nurglings, also known as Nurgle's Little Ones, are merry detractors. Tiny Chumeli by their demonic name, Kangurani'i in the Dark Dialect, they are the mischievous lesser demons of Nurgle. They are the most numerous and beloved of the Plague God's children. Even the very appearance of the Nurglings brings the Lord of all pleasure, for each demon is a miniature copy of its terrible Lord, Initially small balls of indescribable vile matter, Nurglings are fed the pulsing juices of the great unclean one's internal organs, growing into an exact replica of Nurgle himself before bursting into reality as malicious, chubby varmints. Since the opening of the Great Rift and the outpouring of warp energies into the galaxy, Nurglings have become more common in real space. Some new diseases, including the latest strains of the plague, are so powerful that they allow the Nurglings to develop inside the infected. When these vicious creatures are squirmingly born, gnawing their way out or simply emerging from a burst cyst, they begin to do their best to spread more diseases. Can't it slow down? Weng, the plague warriors are right on course. Charge the landmine. Hold on, Trun. What are those things? They're all over the hull. Close the goddamn hatch. Close it. Oh, no, 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 no. The last words of Lieutenant Hostine, commander of the tank, Lemon Russ Rituals of War. Though the Nurglings are the tiniest of Nurgle's minions, they are the most numerous and beloved creatures of the demonic Pantheon Lord of All. Being much smaller than the plague bearers, the demonic foot soldiers of the Plague Lord, or the higher demons known as the Great Unclean, Nurglings are barely a third of a Terran meter tall. Outwardly, they resemble Grandfather Nurgle himself, which is not surprising, for they are formed within the bodies of the Great Unclean, whose physical embodiment also reflects the hideous splendor of the Lord of Decay. Nurglings serve the father of filth that spawned them, often claiming Nurgle himself as their progenitor. They play in the folds of the great unclean one's flesh, bringing him treats, picking at his sores or bestowing new ones, and striving to win the approval of the supreme demon by giggling incessantly. Like Nurgle and most other Nurglic demons, Nurglings are fun and playful by nature. They bounce around and amuse themselves around their larger demonic brethren, entertaining those with their merry antics. As servants of the Lord of Decay should be, they are quite mischievous, biting, scratching, rubbing and tearing anything they like. The mortal servants of the Plague God quickly learn not to trust the Nurglings with anything of value, for upon their return they will inevitably find these things destroyed, torn apart or covered in filth. The demons of Nurgle mimic the Lord of Decay and follow his path in various ways. When they are not competing for the attention of a parent demon, Nurglings often perform behaviours that reflect the jovial nature of Nurgle himself. Because of this, they often interfere with the plague bearers, who find the Nurglings to be something of an inconvenience, though they don't usually voice their displeasure audibly, certainly not when the Great Unclean can hear it. 
When a plague bearer, for example, is just about to finish counting the drops of pus needed to fill some pond, a flock of nurglings may come rushing through, splashing playfully in the stinking sludge and splashing it around. It is in the nature of nurglings to be mischievous, just as it is in the nature of plague bearers to keep count. No wonder that in the realm of chaos, even in such relatively orderly domains as Nurgle's garden, harmony eludes most demons. Ludes. When the traitorous legion of the Death Guard goes to war, infestations of Nurglings spontaneously appear wherever the warriors set foot. They crawl through the insides of plague-ridden ships like cheerful little maggots, suddenly spitting out of ventilation grates and frolicking in the sumps that are centred in the bowels of the ship. On the battlefield, they climb out of ammunition boxes, happily climb onto the hulls of advancing tanks, and even plunge into the insides of the very plague warriors going to war. Some become attached to individual warriors, following their masters like loyal pets and trying to help in any way they can. Many Death Guards find these rambunctious crumbs to be a constant source of trouble, as they lug out rotten grenades, climb up armoured limbs to absorb the noxious waste, and mimic shouted orders in squeaky voices while waving their short arms. Nevertheless, their presence is considered a favour to Nurgle, for Grandfather does not entrust his little ones to just anyone. Individually, the Nurglings are not dangerous opponents. A grown man can kick a demon, throwing it aside, but when Nurglings gather on the battlefield in monstrous packs, they make up for their lack of strength and size with numbers and highly infectious claws and teeth. Most of all, they like to swarm over one and pelt it with the weight of their corrosive bodies. Despite their mischief, the Nurglings are a surprisingly powerful asset in a simmering battle. Huge swarms of demons scurry across the battlefield, infiltrating such hard-to-reach places as tank hulks, sewer systems and collapsed corpse-laden ruins. When an enemy is in the vicinity, Nurglings surge out of cover like a repulsive tidal wave, climbing on top of each other and swamping their victims, who scream furiously and fire panickedly beneath hundreds of flabby bodies. Nurglings are rarely a permanent part of any of the Plague Legions, preferring instead to follow on their heels, running at the commander's feet or nosing among the heralds and infantry ranks. They are very caring creatures who will gladly throw themselves at an enemy if they threaten them or their friends. They move forward like a torrent of anger, swamping victims like an unstoppable wave. Armed with long teeth and sharp claws, the Nurglings bury their foes under a mound of biting and scratching bodies. The wounds inflicted by these small creatures would be inconsequential were it not for the combative toxins and diseases from which the Nurglings are created. Even a tiny wound can lead to infection and death. Nurglings are particularly fond of Victorium, the fourth plague company of the Death Guard, gravitating towards those run by Legion sorcerers. Gangs such as the Lovers of Filth, the Prophets of the Seven, and the acrimonious go into battle on a living carpet of Nurglings. Also well known in the ranks of the Death Guard is the name of Doltrox Globagor. This disease caster, referred to as the Father of Demons, is carried to war by a gibbering mountain of enthusiastic Nurglings. Occasionally, particularly loyal champions of Nurgle find themselves infected by the Nurglings, who begin to live in open wounds and body holes in the champion's armour. The Great Unclean often swallow one of the Nurglings just to see which gash in their giant bodies the giggling creature will once again emerge from. In battle, Nurglings will fiercely defend their host from any enemy that dares to approach. Palanquin Nurgle Nurglings are sometimes given to demonic heralds or other powerful champions of chaos, serving as their living bedfellow or holding them atop the palanquin of Nurgle. A demonic horse shaped like an ornate mobile throne by which a wave of Nurglings can carry the great unclean one or champion of Nurgle. The tiny creatures move the palanquin wherever the Lord wishes. From his lofty position he can speak to slaves or ravage enemies. The palanquin itself is decorated with rotting wares, while the rider simply sits on a chest of decaying cushions. In such cases the Nurglings treat their new Lord as they would treat the great unclean one who spawned them whether the new lord likes it or not. A cloud of buzzing flies surrounds the palanquin, 
If carried into melee combat, the flies stick the eyes and ears of opponents. The insects have another effect, as each fly embodies a small piece of protective magic, and so the cloud is a powerful protective sorcery. The palanquin and its rider are unaffected by spells or psychic attacks of any kind. As the nurglings carry the Lord across the battlefield, small puddles of something smelly and unpleasant are left behind them. These vile puddles consist of pus, various types of bodily secretions, and other vile substances produced by the nurglings. The number of nurglings carrying them makes them very dangerous. Anyone stepping into one of the puddles can catch the dangerous plague known as Nurgle Rot. Stinking, bloated, and filled with a multitude of diseases, the plague bearers are in numerous rows, dragging themselves towards the enemy to crush them. The rotting bodies of the demons are unnaturally strong, absorbing volleys of bursting bolts and scalding laser beams. At the same time, their entropic plague swords are formidable weapons whose deadly slime corrodes metal and causes flesh to rot on contact. As inevitable as the outbreak of a deadly disease, the plague bearers swat away anything their enemies might unleash upon them before they are mercilessly stomped into the dirt. It is the job of the plague bearers to keep track of new diseases and symptoms caused by the activities of Nurgle's followers. Many believe that the plague bearers are created by these diseases, that they are nurtured inside plague victims and fed on its pre-mortem energies to then emerge from their dumped bodies in a heap. The obsession of the demons of organization is evident in their incessant counting and attempts to calculate each new plague outbreak. These monotonous chants lead to little, for it is nearly impossible to catalogue anything in the ever-changing nature of chaos. This does not deter the plague bearers, for they are the embodiment of the need to create order in the universe. Unfortunately for the demons, they often lose count during battle. It is not uncommon for them to stand over dying enemies and groan in frustration before they begin counting again. Some personalities' greatest fear is that mortal flesh will fail them. Decay and putrefaction are constants in a galaxy populated by countless living souls. Life breeds filth and plague, and human life, like a twisted mockery of that fact, breeds lesser demons, the Lord of Torment. Nurgle's rot is probably the greatest gift of the plague god of the ungrateful galaxy, which spawns new plague bearers. Nurgle's rot is incurable, highly contagious, and proceeds slowly but inexorably, leading to death. When the ubiquitous Nurgle plague consumes the body of a human victim, it also devours the soul. This process results in the appearance of the abominable plague bearer. These one-eyed demons look like squishy, emaciated humanoids with bloated stomachs, long, gangly arms, and wide mouths full of broken fangs from which infectious saliva drips. Their foreheads are crowned with ivory horns that are crusted with dried blood, mucus, and pus. In their twisted hands, they clutch blunt, rusty cleavers known as plague swords. Surrounded by a dense cloud of giant black flies, these horrible foes emit buzzing insects and rumbling mournful songs. The bodies of the plague bearers look weak and frail, but exposure to the worst of the diseases from Nurgle's cauldron has made them supernaturally strong. Impervious to pain, ignoring the very notion of injury, they continue to fight only by muttering something, even as they are dismembered. The behavior of plague bearers often frightens mortals even more than their appearance. They do their hard work with all seriousness, calmly accepting the suffering and despair their actions cause. This is not some sadistic pleasure like Slanish's, but rather an adamant recognition of Nurgle's genius, devotion to his craft, and the realization that all of existence ultimately awaits decay. Their desire to spread disease is spurred by a desire to share their father's gifts with the galaxy. Marching forward, they chant the types of plague, smallpox, and other diseases their father created. They're confident that their numbers, like their mortality rate, continue to rise. The plague squads are the most organized and efficient demons on the battlefield. They march purposefully towards their chosen enemy, after which they chop them apart with their plague swords. Death Guard sorcerers often summon plague bearers to the battlefield to reinforce battle lines or plug gaps in the ranks. At times, the power of the pestilence and despair 
spread by the Death Guard, splits the veil of reality and allows plague bearers to spontaneously appear on the battlefield. The muttering demons are the perfect complement to the Death Guard's heavy-handed offensives, absorbing prohibitive amounts of enemy fire and carrying terror with disease before them. The warriors of the Death Guard see the presence of the Plague Bearers as a sign of Nurgle's favour, which he bestows upon them for their efforts. At the same time, the Sons of Mortarion are pragmatic and thus willingly allow the demons to drain the enemy and take the brunt of their fury, giving the Death Guard ample opportunity to close the distance and finish the enemy off. The most famous source of Plague Bearers is the demonic world of Bubonicus, as well as the Garden of Nurgle, the personal realm of the Plague God. Grumbling? I'm not grumbling at all. Though I should be grumbling, leading this bunch of stumbling mites, I can't stand that howling, the never-ending song of the plague-eyed man who won't give another disease a chance. And here they come again, unworthy even of their own phlegm. An example of Glapter's plague-bearers whining. The Herald of Nurgle is an elite plague-bearer, an inferior demon of Nurgle. In the Grandfather Garden that sprawls across the realm of chaos, it is considered a great honour to serve the foot soldiers of the God of Decay. But amongst the Chumanosas are those destined for even greater deeds. Those who display unhealthy zeal and morbid determination, enduring the most hideous of ailments, receive even greater favours from Father Nurgle and are raised to become his heralds. In the fat shadows of the great unclean one are the howling cries of Nurgle's heralds, issuing commands to the plague legions. These champions of plague and despair use their grotesque powers to inspire and lead the lower demons, or to carry out the most important errands of their beloved god in his garden. The heralds of Nurgle have their own proclivities and armaments, which is why they receive their impressive titles. A mortal that resists the ravages of the Nurgle transforms into an unusually resilient creature, the Plague Bearer. The largest and toughest individuals are doomed to one day attain the rank of Herald of the Plague Bearers. These warriors testify to the futility of refusing Nurgle's embrace, but eloquently tell the story of how much the Lord of Decay values determination and perseverance. Through sheer will and defiance, the would-be heralds stand above the plague bearers that surround them. Having proven themselves in battle or service, each will receive a reward from Nurgle himself. The first sign is the elongation of a single horn sticking out of their ugly heads, followed by the growth of a magnificent set of rotting growths that crown this ugly splendor. With the help of the blessed disease-infused touches, the Chew Bearers become even stronger and more resilient, transforming into true champions of their kind. With his newfound strength, the Plague Bearer can cut down several bloodsuckers with a single swing of his rotten sword. The changes undergone by the Plague Bearers are more than just a physical metamorphosis. Imbued with a generous portion of Nurgle's unnatural life force, the Plague Bearers radiate an aura of sickness. This vile atmosphere materializes as a murky fog surrounds them. These emanations are so poisonous that they can empower other minions of Nurgle. This ability makes plague bearers ideal lieutenants to lead plague units into battle, for the herald's energy gives his swords even more power to spread disease of all kinds. With their single glowing eye, plague bearers can cast spells that spew spoils or afflict the enemy with horrible viruses. Unlike the cheerful Great Unclean, the Plague Bearers are closer in temperament to the Plague Bearers, but far less sullen. Filled with far more of the stinking energy of the Nurgle, the Plague Bearers are gifted with a personality that transcends the inner world of any of the muttering younger demons they lead. This is most pronounced in their cheerful sense of humour. The Plague Bearers are always muttering complaints to themselves about the fiercely rumbling voices of the great demons who command them. On the one hand, they are full of hope and enthusiasm because there is so much that can be done. But at the same time, they are extremely annoyed because they are the ones who have been entrusted to do it. In addition to leading the Plague Walker formation, the Plague Bearers can be seen in other roles, both in the Plague Legions and throughout the Nurgle Garden. Powerful, great, unclean ones use heralds as adjutants, personal tasters of disease or their right-hand men. Lord Deript, the great fine-eyed rising favourite of Nurgle, often fields seven heralds as his honorary bubonic guard. 
Ever watchful of his minions, Nurgle personally selects the most experienced of his Chumonos and lavishes them with special commissions. This is a great honor, and such duties are performed with solemn pride, whether it be guarding a sacred spot in the garden or keeping an eye out for some new disease. One of these individuals is Gambler the Rascal. He is tasked with studying the effects of Nurgle's plague on specimens never before seen and then describing them to his master on the porch of his grandfather's estate. Not all ailments created by Nurgle are born as planned. Many are only temporary difficulties, not a worldwide contagion. Some attempts turn out to be even more disastrous, such as the rot that was supposed to gnaw away at flesh, but instead turned out to be a disinfectant. This catastrophe is never spoken of even by the bravest of the great unclean. The disease that eventually became known as the Laughing Pestilence was at first thought to be a silly joke, but when once administered as a punishment quickly became beloved by the Lord of the Plague. A Plague Lord infected with the Laughing Pestilence becomes truly irresistible. Even the scowliest and saddest of Nurgle's creatures, gifted with the Laughing Pestilence, loses her usual shuffling gait and falls into a state that can only be described as comedy fever. The infected person becomes cranky and sarcastic, rambling at anyone who will listen. Once the symptoms of the laughing pestilence are fully manifested, its victim is given the title of Rotten Bagpiper and a new assignment. Gifted with a hideous bagpipe and rattles, these promising Nurgle heralds are sent to entertain Nurgle's warmongering scorekeepers. Admittedly, the bagpiper's antics don't make much of an impression on the gloomy plague bearers, but the great unclean and the nurglings find the constant stream of jokes and nonsensical songs extremely amusing. The great demons emit a rumbling, animalistic laughter that makes their rotten insides spurt out in stinking waves, while the nurglings squeal with laughter. Even the nurgle beasts waddle around enthusiastically, unconsciously eager to join in the fun. Encouraged by the Piper's exploits, the great unclean and the nurglings take up their nefarious work with redoubled vigour. Unfortunately for Nurgle's enemies, demons with the laughing pestilence are contagious, and the warp-born disease can make mortals and demons of other gods laugh with ever-increasing hysteria until their hearts burst or their sides split open. Despite the growing pain, the bagpipers themselves are doomed, for the laughing pestilence always laughs last. Or does he? When the disease goes into remission and the host cannot squeeze out even the slightest chuckle at the most joyous of the great unclean, the herald is subjected to a terrifying magic. It transforms his body, writhing in agony, into a set of gut-wrenching corpse tools that will eventually be handed over to his desperately smiling replacement. The heralds, known as Spoilpox Scriveners, are given a special task by Grandfather Nurgle. Their job is to count the scribes, check their continuous calculations, and make sure their calculations are correct. In order to fulfill their role, the scribes are provided with endless bound scrolls on which they write with special feathers made from the plucked tails of the Lords of Change. They write down the number of illnesses counted by the plague bearers to double check later and write down the names of any plague bearers that have lost count. During their checks, the scribes constantly intimidate those around them, their nasally voices amplified by their swollen jaws that can bite a person in half. This constant abuse of power has a strange motivating effect on the Spoilock Scriveners, forcing them to focus on counting and move with all the agility their swollen, stink-filled joints are capable of. Spoilock Scriveners are sullen and vicious creatures, eager to catch their fellows in error. Or better yet, to record enough transgressions to truly punish them. Those caught repeating their mistakes are destined for a horrible fate through being blessed by the laughing pestilence and turned into rotten pipers. Notable Nurgle heralds, Maggot Tongue. Maggot Tongue is a herald of Nurgle and is part of the adulant host of Hazria the Believer, a demonic warband commanded by the demon prince Hazria the Believer. Verdigrus. Verdigrus was a herald of Nurgle who fought during the siege of the Fenris system alongside the bloodthirster Vorhak. Fugulus. Nurgle's herald, who fought alongside the infernal Tetrad army that participated in the siege of the Fenris system in 999. M41. The infernal Tetrad was composed of demons drawn from the legions of all four of the major chaos gods and was led by four demon princes, 
one for each god. Glubtar fell into disfavor due to his incessant stream of grim objections and was put in charge of the masses of Nurglings that followed the Legion into battle during the final stages of the Plague Wars in Ultramar. Though originally intended as punishment for his rotten attitude, the results of the attacking waves of his Nurglings were so impressive that the position has been a permanent fixture ever since. Glabtar naturally is constantly disgruntled and whining about it. Epidemius, also called Taliman of Nurgle, is the powerful herald of Nurgle and one of the seven leaders of the Plague Lord among his demonic legions. Cataloguing Nurgle's myriad diseases lies with Epidemius, the chosen scorekeeper of the Lord of Decay. Epidemius is one of the seven proctors of Epidemic, leading the many legions of plague bearers that answer to the call of Nurgle. Raised atop a rotting palanquin by a horde of Nurglings, Epidemius moves among the demons of Nurgle, sweeping up each of the many diseases and illnesses released into the universe. This task is impossible to accomplish, for Nurgle is constantly creating new diseases, and his anarchic hosts are intensely spreading previously unseen miraculous ailments. Nurgle's diseases work not only on the body, but also on the soul, destroying one's sense of self and moral bearings just as much as the flesh. The Epidemius can track the trail of the crumbling soul of the recently slain to gain all sorts of knowledge from it and siphon off some of its spiritual power. As a thank you, the Herald begins to beat the bells, whose lilting sounds celebrate the soul's entry into Nurgle's arms. The Epidemius goes where Nurgle's disease-causing gifts are found in abundance. His corpulent body, resembling an extremely bloated plague-bearer, is often seen on the battlefields of real space. For infected wounds and fresh corpses are fertile ground for disease, whose odour attracts the Epidemius like a rotting wound attracts a fly. Amidst the raging conflict, the Epidemius monitors the spread of filth and decay from its own violent place, carefully noting every bubo, pustule and ulcer. Even as Epidemius takes notes, Grandfather Nurgle is still aware of his findings. The Plague God strains the information he receives for future experiments. The more notes Epidemius takes, the more attention the Lord of Decay pays him, bestowing the Herald's legions with the greatest of his blessings. To better watch the spread of disease, Epidemius orders his palanquin to be carried to the front lines, where nurgling rapists and an obese herald battle any enemy who dares pass close enough to interfere with the accountant's work. As the plague drones descend, the air is filled with the horrible trinkling of insectoid wings. Saddling the monstrous rotting flies are the senior plague bearers. This aerial cavalry strikes at enemy lines like a punching bag, knocking enemies to the ground with its mass of stinking bodies. Furry limbs tear flesh and break bones. Needle-sharp trunks pierce the joints of armor and eye lenses, injecting a disease-causing toxin inside victims. The hideous mouth parts open and suck the contents of the screaming warriors' heads, slurping them like a treat. Meanwhile, the demonic riders slash their foes with plague swords and hurl the infernal dead heads into the ranks of their enemies, who are then swallowed by the swirling clouds of plague spores and disease. Such an onslaught is enough to break the spirit of even well-entrenched foes, and plague slumbers often outflank or break the center of enemy lines. These vile creatures can fly at astonishing speeds, absorb an incredible amount of firepower directed at them, and deal massive damage. They are highly prized by the Death Guard, who sacrifice heavily to bring these monsters to their side. Speed and maneuverability is one of the few weaknesses of the Death Guard. As such, champion commanders will always find plenty of roles for a couple of packs of plague-ridden cowards. Delaying and destroying flanking enemy forces or scouts, swiftly attacking vulnerable enemies, intercepting airborne or quickly reinforcing into weak spots in Death Guard orders. All of this makes them versatile and powerful allies. However, these riders are arrogant, for they hold high positions in the demonic legions of Nurgle, while their horses hate all mortals, regardless of origin. Therefore, the Death Guard can only hope that the summoned plague drones will follow the plans and not their own whims. So what are the demonic race of plague drones? They are giant demons in the guise of hideous insects, whose appearance is so horrific that it leaves scars in the mind. These vile creatures are some of Nurgle's most hideous creations. Only the forbidden volumes of the Eldari Black Library describe the forbidden process that spawns these creatures. 
for they hatch in the viscous depths of Nurgle's gardens in the realm of chaos, where seers wander in their dreams. In the enthusiastic souls of some of Nurgle's beasts, frustrated by the passivity of their toys, a seed of malice germinates. Repressed puzzlement leads to despair and eventually to hurtful resentment. Over the millennia, this tiny grain of malice grows into the heart of the beast, feeding on the energies of its depressed state and anxiety until it begins to throb like an ulcer. The final straw is the betrayal of someone the creature wishes to call friend, which leads to the beast's death. Seeking reconciliation, the beast casts aside doubts and optimistically goes to the ranks of the mortals he has cornered. If one of the ungrateful warriors can bring the beast down with a successful sword strike or plasma charge, the howling creature will disappear into the warp. Back in the Immaterium, the beast wanders lazily and snorts before falling into the dirt of Nurgle's garden with a dejected sigh. The realization that he will not be able to the pleasures of the mortal realm fester within him as the beast revels in grief over the injustices of the universe. For centuries, the beast perches, protected from harsh reality by the creeping cover of Nurgle's fattest flies. Demonic metamorphosis begins as the chitinous ball of hatred within the beast grows stronger into the sickly carcass of a past incarnation. Eventually, the creature bursts from its cocoon in the guise of an adult rotting fly. This brutally malice-filled creature is obsessed with revenge against an indifferent universe. Beasts of Nurgle. The Beast of Nurgle, also called a Slime Hound and Nurgle's Lapdog, is a demonic beast in the service of the plague god Nurgle that is truly a horror on the battlefield. It has the soft, sticky and mottled body of a pallid slug, webbed feet that flap uselessly, a face of writhing green tentacles and a whiptail growth that bursts from its back and which wags constantly from side to side. The essence of mindless decay and horrid rot given putrid flesh Beasts of Nurgle exemplify the Plague Lord's endless enthusiasm and excitement for forces of life and death. Thus, a beast delights in discovering new things and making, to its very simple mind, new friends. When brought into real space, they act almost akin to a curious and inquisitive pet, investigating anything and everything in sight and spreading illness and rot wherever they go. They advance slowly but steadfastly. They can only be stopped by the most formidable of weapons, for the beasts are as relentless as the decay they embody. Each creature is a nightmarish jumble of body parts, with a long neck holding its head wide open, eyes wide open and an expression of barely blissful dementia on its muzzle. From their gaping toothy mouths a tongue spills out from which a disgusting mucus drips. From their necks and backs protrude writhing tubes, spewing paradises of buzzing flies, clouds of vomitous gases, flesh-eating liquids that can find a breach in even the most reliable armour, and other vile gifts. The beasts of Nurgle are as dangerous as they are ugly. Their touch causes paralysis, and their viscous secretions cause anything they come in contact with to rot. Mere proximity to a demon is enough to destroy small animals and plants, and even larger creatures can visibly age and wither in the presence of the beasts, for they are the embodiment of universal decay. Despite their monstrous appearance and deadly features, the beasts of Nurgle themselves are affectionate creatures who behave like very friendly and easily excitable puppies in all things. They crave attention and greet new arrivals by slobbering them from head to toe with slimy tentacles. Once in real space, they behave almost like inquisitive and inquisitive pets, studying everything and everyone in sight and spreading squirming and rotting wherever they go. The rambunctious beasts can rarely, if ever, contain themselves and thus leave behind acrid piles of slime. All this attention is no problem for other creatures and servants of Nurgle, but it very quickly leads to the death of mortals. Unlike most demons, the beasts do not kill with sharp claws and ripping teeth, but with a strange form of kindness. Numerous tentacles stroke, nip and rub their victims, while a long slobbering tongue licks them, leaving slime behind. In a short time, the victim becomes sick, infected and liquefied before being crushed by the beast's huge carcass. The demon in turn feels a slight sadness that the now dead friend cannot join in the fun, but quickly forgets about it when something or someone catches the beast's attention. 
When the demon's new friend stops moving, it quickly shifts its interest to another target, and thus the creature animated and lovingly poisons and kills almost everything it touches. As the beast possesses only a rudimentary mind, it never realizes the consequences to which its feisty behavior leads. The demon experiences only a mild sense of disappointment when new friends become immovable and boring. The beasts, the Nurgles, that appear in battle alongside the Astartes heretics from the traitorous Death Guard Legion are cynically used as breakout units. The Legionnaires have no time for attention and are not at all eager to be crushed by the weight of the lumbering beasts. Death Guard warriors drive demons toward enemy lines by any means necessary, often baiting them with fast tanks or gangs of hapless chaos cultists. If the creature manages to punch a hole in the enemy's camp, the Sons of Mortarion take advantage without delay. A telling example of the destructive power of the Nurgle beasts occurred on Gabala III in the realm of Winterscale in Corona space. In the province of Gavaudan, hundreds of people were killed by a beast roaming the croplands, destroying crops, herd animals and buildings. The seemingly unstoppable demon was finally killed only through the combined efforts of law enforcers and local planetary militia units. However, the demon's presence remained even after its demise, for the crops quickly withered and many arable fields had to be scorched to bedrock to get rid of the unhealthy spoilage. As another example, consider the use of the Nurglo beasts of the Death Guard in the Third Battle of Tirana Pass. After the occurrence of the Distress Stars, Victorium and the Death Guard struck the nearby worlds to ensure that no enemy could prevent the gathering of Mortarion for the invasion of Ultramar in the coming Plague Wars. On the planet Daxar, the Apostles of Infestation met serious resistance from Astra Militarum forces centered around the 56th Cadian Heavy Infantry Regiment. Though the Death Guard managed to dislodge the Cadians from the defensive positions of Golian City before beginning to pursue them into the northern deserts outside the settlement, the Death Guard entrenched themselves in the Tirana Pass, where they repelled all attacks with conventional weapons. Realizing that the enemy was gathering reserves for a coordinated counterattack and planned to remain on Daxa to thwart Mortarion's plans, a Death Guard lord named Taluk Plague Gut ordered a powerful summoning ritual to be orchestrated. As the clouds spiralled overhead and the moons in the heavens began to creep backwards, several hundred Nurgle beasts materialised in reality, frolicking and moving towards the Imperial defensive lines. Cadian fire destroyed dozens of the creatures. More beasts found themselves chopped up and torn apart at close range, but the remaining ones continued to approach inexorably followed by the Death Guards who had suffered heavy losses. As the fortifications were destroyed, the pass turned red from the Imperial blood that had been spilled, and soon Daxar fell. And seven plagues shall come, and in them you shall read his labours, prescribed with black bile and red ruins throughout the land, and he shall pass among you. All shall feel his touch and dawdle. In genuine joy he will bestow these gifts. Rejoice! Imperial Astropad Sightzeil, seconds before the execution. The great and the unclean. The great and unclean are the grotesque Natuk supreme demons of the plague god, Nurgle. The god of chaos, disease, death and decay. They are loathsome demons, the heralds of the lord of rot and destruction. And are some of Grandfather Nurgle's greatest servants. The bearers of his most sacred plague and pestilence. The great and unclean ones are fat and enormous and their bodies are covered with rotting flesh and sores from which ooze disgusting rivulets of pus. Intestines spill out of giant tears in their bloated colossal bellies. This monstrous carcass is held up on two incredibly small and seemingly atrophied legs, and the oversized bulbous heads of the great unclean are topped with long deer-like antlers. To the mortal eye, the supreme demons of Nurgle are undeniably the most vile demonic servants of destructive forces, Afflicted with fly eggs and maggots, internal organs come into view through rips and deep wounds in the bloated belly as the creature clumsily moves forward. Clusters of pustules and oozing buboes on its side burst open, spawning small swarms of giggling nurglings. 
Noxious juices flow from dozens of infected sores, leaving a glistening, slimy trail behind the great unclean. Few mortals possess a stomach strong enough, let alone the will, to withstand such a creature. The great unclean are Nurgle's lieutenants, the field generals of his plague legions. Despite their monstrous and terrifying appearance, the supreme demons exhibit a fatherly affection that blends strangely with their nightmarish bodies. Sociable and sentimental, the great unclean take pride in the successes of their followers and regard all the creatures of their legion as their own children. While their subordinates look up to them as the embodiment of Grandpa Nurgle, each great unclean gives his followers meticulous attention and takes noticeable pride in their appearance and affectionate treatment. The High Demons take pleasure in every little pustule on the bodies of their minions, delighting in the variety of their ailments and showering them with thunderous praise. With a wave of the hand, these monsters send counting hordes on the offensive, shouting words of encouragement and laughter more akin to gurgling. All of the Great Unclean have unbridled energy and assertiveness. They are constantly working to spread decay. The High Demons cannot think of their own convenience as long as there are still parts of the galaxy that have not learned the touch of Nurgle's riches. Let rot to disease take root, to nurture the fateful plague. Aegilhor, the bringer of the plague, is the supreme demon of Nurgle. The great unclean are copies of their god Chaos, both physically and spiritually. Each supreme demon is in some sense a Nurgle, and their followers often refer to them as Papa or Father Nurgle. In character, the Great Unclean are rarely morose. They are usually driven by a simple enthusiasm that spurs mortals as well. They are sociable and even sentimental by nature, and have a special tenderness for their followers. It is not uncommon for the Great Unclean to refer to their listeners as their children, and take great pride in their appearance and oddly sweet demeanour. They happen to rival each other in spreading Nurgle's plague blessings across the galaxy. They take pride in the success of their closest servants of the Fly Lord, ranting about the splendour of the diseases and plagues of those around them, and laughing heartily at the death and destruction wrought in the name of Nurgle. Their arrival in the mortal realm is heralded by ear-splitting and jubilant cries as they break through the veils of reality, rejoicing in the opportunity to once again walk beneath the firmament of real space and shower mortals with rich gifts of plague. Often before their arrival, there are epidemics of disease and devastation on a planetary scale, when entire populations are afflicted by the corruption of the Lord of all things' favourite plague, the rot of Nurgle. This disease is the most contagious, predatory and monstrous of all the plagues and fevers ever created by Father Nurgle. A mortal exposed to it suffers slowly as the plague destroys bodies, turning them into bloated, rotting, living corpses after which comes the inevitable agonizing death. Slippery with bile, the great and the unholy walk around the ruined cities and piles of the dying, joyously sharing blessings and rising up in a lively wave of giggling to chattering Nurglings. The rival gods of Nurgle lavish favors on their higher demons in various ways. However, the Lord of Decay loves all children equally, even if some are clearly more successful than others. The Great Unclean have a nickname, and tasks are given to them based on their stage of growth and their current fertility. Those given the title Lord of Fecundity are usually busy breeding diseases and leading legions of fecundity, or working in the Garden of Nurgle. The title Grand Plague Bearer means that the Great Unclean commands legions of infections and is in charge of spreading delightful perniciousness. It is said that to gain exalted status, the Grand Unclean must successfully lead a Plague Legion in each stage of the cycle. The Great Unclean are lively and boisterous, filled with a natural drive to organize and see things through to completion. Forced to guide Nurgle's chaotic endeavors, they try to give the demonic rabble under their command, purpose and direction. Droplets of yellow-green saliva fly from his wide-open mouth as the Great Unclean orders his henchmen to move forward. The High Demon, with a reproachful grunt, prods those who are slow or less than energetic in their pursuit of Grandfather Nurgle's goal. 
The love of his servants fills the great unclean's heart with joy, but the enemy's attempts to thwart Nurgle provoke their anger, which turns into parental rage when his subordinates are harmed. In war, the great unclean inspire terror. Though the supreme demons are heavy-handed, they are almost impossible to stop, for they ignore the bolts and blades of the enemy like those insignificant but annoying insects. Driven by the inertia of its attack, the Great Unclean One unleashes its gigantic soul upon its victims with all possible force. This self-sacrificial act fills the rotting heart of the Supreme Demon with warmth. Survivors will have to face painful chains, bile swords with iron blades and rusty doomsday bells. But it's not the physical attacks alone that make the Great Unclean so dangerous. With a deep breath of the festering forces of the warp, he can summon a corrupt wind to weaken his enemies, spew forth a seething and steamy wave of filth, maggots and slime, or bless his subordinates with new tumorous growths that will cover the worst of wounds. In the event of a threat to the great unclean, thousands of tiny nurlings following the supreme demon would immediately attack careless opponents, burying them beneath the murderous wave. The naturally spawned Fall Eaters gather around the Supreme Demon by the thousands, trailing and protecting it. Hordes of black flies, rats, vultures, crows and worms always follow the Great Unclean. The Great Unclean have long since felt no pain as a result of their abundant infections, plagues and terrible sores. Their truly gigantic size and ability to endure almost any injury and pain make the higher demons dangerous opponents for they can absorb an astounding amount of damage before finally falling asleep. Their large and thick build is oddly matched by their astounding skill. They swiftly bear down upon their foes, laughing loudly and slaying their opponents with huge rusty cleavers and seven-ball plague chains. The thick cloud of flies that feed on the demon's sores hinders enemies from attacking and spreads the noxious diseases. The gurgling nurglings form a formidable vanguard in front of the great unclean and do their best to help their lord share his favourite ailments with everyone around him. Famous great unclean, sing sweet chorus of afflictions, let there be more voices and buboes, bestow a beautiful plague upon them and let their rotting eyes leak out. Grubix, lord of smallpox, the supreme demon of Nurgle. The Eldari imprisoned Batulas inside a psychic construct called the Black Pyramid, on the imperial world of Hive Arius. The key to the prison was an artifact known as the Lycos Talisman, which turned out to be split into three pieces. One was found on the Space Wolves' homeworld of Fenris, the second on the world of Gauld, and the third in the vaults of the Inquisition. At the end of the 41st millennium, Batulaz manipulated several servants of the Imperium to fuse together the parts of the talisman in order to f Bellatrax. In the year 529 of the 33rd millennium, a vast army of Immaterium, fearfully called the Demon Wave, swept through three Imperial sectors. In the path of the demons were five nighthouses, commanded by the famed aristocrats of House Terin, who formed the adamant bastion to stop the demon rampage. With the help of fast-moving packs of squires like Helverin and Glavia, the High Queen of Desmodar, Terin led the demons through the broken streets of Bagudar. As the warp spawned creatures poured onto the empty plain, they were bombarded with a devastating bombardment of two dozen knights, like Costilian. The demons suffered phenomenal casualties, but without showing a single sign of fear, they rushed to retaliate. More than 600 Quistoris class knights rushed towards them, withstanding a barrage of sorcery, fire, and dirt that turned the night into rubble. With Queen Desmodara and her High Court at the tip of their attack, the knights charged into the untold demonic horde. They hammered their way into the heart of the Immaterium host, the ground shaking under their footsteps and their foul orb littering the knights' feet. Though the Empyrean spawn with sparkling warp energies managed to destroy one machine after another, the onslaught of the knights was unstoppable. In the end, with howling reaper chain swords and crackling thunderstrike gauntlets, the highest courts of the three night houses clashed against the demonic wave lord. The ensuing battle was so grandiose and devastating that it spawned a hundred songs, tales, and tapestries. 
Knights of the type Brave named Lord of Iron and Cruel Destroyer successfully bound the foul brats with thunder harpoons before the giant great unclean bellow tracks killed these brave knights. When the prey lost the ability to move, the knights chopped the mighty demon to pieces. The banishment of Bellatrax put an end to the demonic horde, though they managed to cause much destruction before perishing in the warp. From that day on, Bellatrax held an eternal grudge against House Terran and all of its unborn heirs. Later, in the years following the opening of the Great Rift, Bellatrax would get his chance for revenge. Amidst the seething rage before the wet straits, High King Tybalt led his knights of House Terran in an offensive against the invaders of Tau. They struck the newly conquered Tau world of the colony of Chancet, which was formerly an Imperium-owned planet called Gossomer. At first, the Terran offensive was going well. The knights were supported by a force of space marines from the Order of the Raven Guard, who were engaged in reconnaissance and responded swiftly to all of the Xeno's rapid maneuvers. The battle took an unexpected turn, however, when a matted mud thickened in the skies and a black rain fell on the ground, causing everything it touched to rot. From the sucking mire rose the demons of Nurgle, led by the swollen abomination of the great unclean bellow tracks. In the ensuing ferocious conflict, House Terran suffered terrible losses when the vengeful Belothrax severely wounded High King Tybalt and slew the knights of three of his closest kin. It was only after the Raven Guard forced the Tau forces to engage the demonic horde that Tybalt's highest court was able to effect a breakthrough. The crippled Imperial forces retreated to the evacuation point with a fight that did not stop fighting the rambling plague creatures. They left Chancet at the mercy of the frustrated demons, who immediately began to bring suffering to the Tau. During the Battle of Gomogor in the early 41st millennium, the Second Company of Kos Imperator, recently reinforced by Primaris Astartes, found themselves on the besieged world of Hive Gomogor, attacked by countless Nurglic demon armies. Divisions of the intercessors were able to create a series of barrier firing lines in the ruins of the city of Julia Agrippa, but for every demon killed, two more took the place of each one, emerging from the dark tunnels beneath the city and trooper casualties were mounting. Operating in complete secrecy, the strike team of the Harbinger, the Fifth Brotherhood of the Grey Knights, teleported into the sub-city. Their prey was the great unclean Gulgul Ngatol, who had turned the vast sewers of Agrippa into his personal baths. Hordes of plague demons appeared endlessly from the mire of stinking mush. After a bloody battle, the strike force sent the great unclean back to warp. Gomogoru was rescued, but the scythes never knew thanks to what. Kugath is the Plague Father. Kugath was once an unknown Nurgle, a tiny baby sitting on the huge shoulder of the Nurgle himself. As the Lord of Decay was mixing his deadliest poison, Kugath fell from his nest right into the cauldron. He took a large gulp of whatever was splashing in the rusty cauldron and swelled with its power. He drank and drank until the cauldron was empty. Kugath puffed up with corroding rot and grew into the mighty, great unclean. Nurgle laughed as he watched the writhing of his new creation, which embodied the perfect disease that gurgled in the rash cauldron. Though Nurgle was not at all upset by this turn of events, Kugath realized that he had deprived his father of the greatest of all diseases, a contagion that could outshine even the most pernicious wonders of Nurgle's rot. Ever since, Kugath has been searching for a way to recreate the poisonous wonder that created himself. The Plague Father is a sullen creature who keeps aloof from the other higher demons of Nurgle. The gurgling, the pleasures of petty infections are not for Kugath. He is hard at work on a task he has thrust upon himself, and his quest requires him to travel everywhere, searching for every disgusting ingredient and rare disease imaginable. Kugath, stronger than the other demons of Nurgle, is eager to enter the mortal realm, for he finds the countless battlefields to be the perfect place to pick up new subjects for experimentation and field trials. Sitting in a palanquin filled to the brim with the supplies of his mobile laboratory, Kugath travels the universe on the chests of straining Nurglex, 
searching for the elusive combination of rashes and afflictions that can recreate the perfect disease. The carpet groaning from the Nurglik's incredible weight is constantly renewed. The rotting innards of the Kugarth produce these vicious creatures at epidemic speed. Each contains the unique blend of elements from which the Plague Father was created. In battle, Kugath picks up a Nurgling, strokes it lightly on the head, then dips it in a cauldron of gurgling necrotic liquid and hurls it at the enemy. The Nurglings squeal with delight as they fly, then burst from the impact and shower the enemy with their corrosive juices and plague-laden filth. Kugath watches them with detached interest, noting only how each contagion manifests and spreads. But his mind is already considering how to enhance the impact of the next brew. When the Death Guard siege of the Imperial world of Nebus Hive, which began in the early 42nd millennium, reached the seven-year mark, the sorcerers of Mortarion summoned an ancient evil to their aid. The uncommon Great Unclean, known as Rotigus, joined the fray, spreading a terrifying aura of hellish exuberance. The hive's protein vats became overflowing as the slurry of flesh inside began to grow at an incredible rate, burying entire levels beneath the load of bloated meat. All manner of pests began mad cycles of birth and death, and Imperial defenders were overwhelmed by waves of cesspool rats, grey worm infestations, and swarms of millions of ravenous disemboweling fry. The worst of all was the Nurla Flood, an endless barrage of stinking, dirty water teeming with disease-causing bacteria. Soon the arid steppes of Nebus became swamps, and the water levels in the stinking oceans continued to rise. Corpse-filled hives filled with rats, their remaining garrisons retreating to the upper levels, trying to find an escape that didn't exist. Blessed by the excessive generosity of Rotigus and his demons, methodically torn to shreds by the rumbling guns of the Death Guard, the last defenders of Nebus met a brutal death almost as a mercy, after which the world fell into the clutches of the Plague God. Scobea Atrax the Bloated, also known as Papagap, Lord of the Corrupted Pit, spawning maggots and the Wind of Nurgle. Scobia Atrax was summoned by the forces of Chaos on Vrax Prime in the year 830 of the 41st millennium. During a devastating military campaign recorded in Imperial databases as the Siege of Vrax, Septicus Seven was the Great Unclean, leading the Rotten Legion and the right hand of the Supreme Demon Kugath in the elite demonic guard of the Nurl Plague. Septicus often carries stomachs ripped out of some enemies with hollow horns threaded through them, which he plays like a ghastly bagpipe. The resulting horrible sounds annoy even his closest demons. In the final years of the Plague Wars, Septicus helped the Plague Guard take over the Garden World and Axe in the realm of Ultramar. The Plague Guard then invaded Parmenio and later faced Imperial forces led by Lord Commander of the Imperium, Robot Gilliman. During the battle, Gilliman defeated Septicus, and the Emperor's sword sent the demon's essence into oblivion, ending the existence of the Great Unclean forever. To those subjected to their loathsome assaults, the legions of Nurgle seem like an amorphous mass, but amidst the shambling anarchy there is purpose and design. Like the stages of the diseases they carry, each plague legion is part of an overarching cycle of fecundity and decay, and exists only to see Nurgle's garden flourish and his gifts bestowed. From the garden of Nurgle lumber, the plague legions, the dreaded armies of the Great Corruptor. When they go to war, be it in the realm of chaos or real space, they bring the boundless generosity of their master and the products of his endless labours with them, and leave contagion, anguish and death in their wake. All plague legions are Nurgle's creations, and so carry pestilence and propagate their master's foul will, yet each is associated with specific stages of the Flylord's cycle of decay and regeneration. The Fecundus legions are tasked with the making of diseases. It is they that travel across reality and unreality to gather the raw ingredients that will be added to the cauldron of their foul god, and the worst ills suffered by the mortal races can be attributed to their diligence. The Infecticus legions are the harbingers of infection, the carriers of new diseases that lay the groundwork for the greater virulence to follow. The Pathogenus legions are disease-fully bloomed, 
sickness made manifest, the very height of contagion. They are equally capable in both attack or defense and will be often be deployed to guard key sites within Nurgle's garden or spearhead an assault. The epidemic legions contain the most demons for they expand, proliferate and regenerate. It is they that spread outwards, ensuring initial gains turn into rampaging outbreaks. The rot legions revel in decay, their festering powers and potent blessings able to break down anything. More than any other legion, their presence cultivates the ground for the Garden of Nurgle to spread. The Morbidus legions are the reapers, the toll-takers, and the bringers of death. The Necroticus legions are the most resilient. They use hopelessness and despair as a weapon and can absorb terrific punishments. And on it goes, each of the legions specializing in some grotesque aspect of Nurgle's cycle of birth, decay, death, and rebirth. Each plague legion is led by a great unclean one, a greater demon of Nurgle that acts as its general. They dote over their charges in the manner of a loving parent, cajoling each of their plague legions seven talibans upon its appointed tasks. Ever eccentric, Nurgle encourages the same aberrations amongst the most powerful of his shepherds. These unusual traits go as far towards colouring the composition and tactics of the army they lead, as does the legion type itself. Some great unclean ones, for example, favour entirely airborne assaults, going to battle with clouds of plague drones that darken the skies and excel at aerial strikes. Others enjoy seeing their victims buried in slavering beasts of Nurgle, or ground slowly into the dirt by wave after wave of mumbling plague bearers. Great unclean ones cycle through phases over the course of their immortal lifespans, assuming new mantles with each new legion they take command of. For example, they may lead an epidemic legion to spread diseases before moving on to command a rot legion in order to bask in such maladies. When the cycle nears its end, a great unclean one will scab over with necrotic patches, and in his state of advanced decay will lord over a necroticus legion. It is not long before his body will shed the rotting husk of its old skin to reveal the new blooms of fresh disease, and it is then he will once again lead a fecundus legion. Beneath the great unclean one are the leaders of the Talibans, either demon princes or demonic heralds such as poxbringers, sloppity bile pipers and spoilpox scriveners. Each receives a grandiloquent title of the general's invention, selected to match the bearer's skills, proclivities or war tasks. Examples include the Lords of Fulsome Filth, the Almighty Bringer of Rancid Decay, or the Sloptoxic Master of Bubbling Buboes. The Talibans can vary in size, swelling to epidemic proportions as Nurgle's power waxes, or contracting into small, elite warbands when it wanes. At its peak, however, a Taliban is composed of seven packs of the lesser demons known as Plague Bearers or Plague Drones. Depending upon the predilections of its leader and the ebb and flow of the cycle, a Taliban may also include beasts of Nurgle or swarms of Nurglings, although such anarchic beasts rarely remain with the formation beyond the duration of a battle. In our eyes, human existence is filled with hopes, dreams, nobility and weaknesses. In their eyes, however, we are wheat waiting for the reaper's scythe. Inquisitor Gareth reasoning about the enemy from without. Interesting specimens of Nurgle's followers in the material world. Vile savants. The vile savants are horrific demonic manifestations of the diseases that have claimed mortal lives. They are clothed in the decaying remains of their victims' flesh and are avatars of plague and destruction. Savants appear as figures wearing hermetically sealed restraining suits, slick with mucus and phlegm droplets, which is like beads of sweat on the skin of a fever-stricken man. Inside there is nothing but corrupted flesh and squirming rodents that the suit prevents from disintegrating. The demonic forces guiding the savants fill their stumbling boneless limbs with an eerie and unwavering determination. The savants are surrounded by an ossified aura of absolute terror and rotting miasmas, such that even being near these creatures can be described as nightmarish. Even worse is hearing eleven voices in your head, or becoming a victim of the savants' flesh-deadening experiments. The vile savants are warp-generated diseases that have been given bodies. They are sent to fill worlds with suffering and turn them to rotting ruins. They are not chaos worshippers, fanatics or deluded fools worshipping a false god. They are the weary dead whose lives were taken by the plague. 
Now they walk at the will of demons. Legends among the servants of the pernicious forces say that the savants were spawned by an unclean compound of contagions released centuries ago in a forgotten war. It is said that in the distant past, a huge hospital ship was sent to fight an outbreak of disease and plague resulting from the constant wars around the Eye of Terror. However, in addition to the arms of the healers, it secretly carried another deadly cargo, an arsenal of terrifying weapons. Biological agents, necrotic poisons, and alien fevers gathered from a hundred worlds. Legend has it that this giant life-saving Ark, whose name has long since been lost to myth, suffered a breach of the Heller Field as it passed through the warp near the Eye of Terror. In the moments that followed, warp forces cracked the protective stasis of the deadly asylum and spread viral samples throughout the ship, infusing them with unholy life and consciousness. The released horrors quickly overwhelmed most of the ship and sent thousands of screaming souls into oblivion. The medical staff trapped aboard the ship met a far worse fate, for they found themselves possessed by a demonic virus that took over their bodies. Thus came the vile savants, the embodiment of emotionless, indiscriminate death, unleashed by the warp to wage a silent war against all life. The savants themselves are eerie to look at, their stinking and defiled biohermetic suits filled with bubbling rot. These creatures are boneless, relentless, and as silent as death. The savants possess the skills and knowledge of long-dead body owners that combine with the evil warp intelligence and occult power of the demons of decay and disease. They are consumed by hatred for all living and breathing things and wage their war of annihilation in the most nightmarish of ways. The savant disease that has come to life is their darkest harbinger. It overflows into the warp and infects a single mortal who has attracted the attention of the contagion by his desperation and sickness. With that, the plague begins to spread. The infection begins to run rampant and prepares the way for the vile savants to emerge, unleashing their vengeance and showering humanity with gifts shared by Nurgle, Lord of Decay, Demonic Plague. Vile savants are demonic entities that do not need to plot intrigue as mortals. They do not weave plots or breed nests of vice like chaos occultists, nor do they answer the calls of sorcerers unless it serves their purposes. While cultists can spread like a disease, vile savants are literally a warp-born contagion. They breed in the flesh of reality just as viruses do, traveling from organ to organ, filling their hosts with disease until they fail them and collapse. The vile savants have only one single devouring desire, to spread disease and kill until there are none left. There is no bargain to be made with these nightmares. They cannot be calmed, pacified, or somehow diverted from their purpose. Ordo Malleus believes that this one of the foulest of sicknesses is the result of the work of a pernicious force known as the Lord of Decay, Nurgle, the Plague Father, and the Herald of Despair. These warp entities are classified by the Ordo Malleus as a stampede of Fede, plague zombies named after the region of the Calixis sector where they were first encountered. The savants themselves are merely deadly vessels, avatars of infernal species of plague. Each stage of the maelstroms of Fide's outbreaks increases in death and horror until their cumulative total shatters the barriers between the real world and the warp after which the dead will rise again, and the vile savants will come to claim the trophy. The unclean dead, outbreaks of various strains of zombie plague or incidents where the dead were raised by warp-breaking nefarious technology or necromantic sorcery, have been known to the Imperium for millennia, but they remained relatively rare. Over the past Solarian decades, however, the sectors and worlds of the Mapskuru segment have recorded a greatly increased number of such cases, which are linked to disease cults and an ancient enemy. The involvement of entities known as vile savants in the outbreak of these monstrous plague species is a new and dangerous development for the Imperium. They bring a malevolent intelligence to such occurrences, making them much more difficult to fight or contain. The Horde with the Tabernacle segment believes that the vile savants are responsible for numerous outbreaks of plague and carnage in settlements, aboard void ships and city streets in the Calixis, Mandragore, Medusan and Ixaniad sectors. The worlds of Nurgle are varied and volatile, 
and who knows what horrors are stored in their murky, stinking depths. You've heard much about Nurgle today. As you listened about him, he listened and watched you, smiling good-naturedly and stirring his brew. Who knows what gift it will bestow upon you?